The ACC, the Pac-12 did not as well. Might they look to slow play college football playoff expansion a little bit to get that contract opened up to other bidders besides the one that currently holds the rights to it? Again, all of that is expected to be on the table. Who are we going to hear from? I mentioned it off the top, the three commissioners. Uh, Kevin Warren, of course, everyone is familiar with the Big Ten commissioner, has been in the post now for two years after spending the previous 15 years with the Minnesota Vikings. Jim Phillips, of course, a very familiar name for fans of the Big Ten. He was long time the commissioner, uh, the athletic director, I should say, at Northwestern before being named the commissioner of the ACC in December of last year. And then the newcomer in that group, not just to the commissioner's post, but also to college athletics in general, George Klyovkov, who was named the Pac-12 commissioner on May the 13th, coming from a background at MGM Resorts. So again, those are the three we are expected to hear from. You saw the topics they are expected to address. Now, just because those are the topics they are expected to address doesn't mean there won't be many questions on any other topics. You have to believe that the topic of expansion in general and whether or not these leagues in general are looking to add members, that is clearly going to come up. Their stance on the college football playoff, no doubt, will be front and center as that has been much debated here over the last few weeks. Certainly once there was the announcement made of the addition of Oklahoma and Texas, this notion of a 12-team college football playoff all of a sudden becomes somewhat less palatable in this environment in terms of uh, whether or not the other leagues are going to get the access that they wanted to get to that playoff. Now you see the three commissioners here, Kevin Warren, George Klyovkov, and Jim Phillips. Again, we're going to go hear from them in just a moment on this historic day as they announced the alliance of their three conferences. Again, eyeing the future of college athletics, how college athletics are evolving, and the direction in which these three leagues believe they ought to evolve. Let's look through a, a timeline of how we got to this point. Again, oh, it, it, it sounds like we're actually beginning the news conference, so let's listen in. Momentarily, but I did want to go through just a couple quick reminders. If possible, we would request that everyone please go ahead and stay on mute until it is your opportunity to ask questions. The way we're going to uh, structure today's uh, press conference is we will have opening statements from each of our three commissioners, followed by a question and answer portion. When we get to that question and answer portion, I'll be glad to provide some instructions on how we will go about making that happen. I would also like to let the group know that we are recording this both from an audio and a video perspective, so we will have those files to share later. It's now my pleasure to introduce the three commissioners who will each give a formal opening statement before we ask any questions. Let's start with ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for your interest and for taking the time to join us today to discuss our groundbreaking alliance. First, I wanna thank Commissioners Warren and Klyovkov for their partnership, transparency, and commitment during our discussions over the last month or so. We never could have reached this point with our, without our collective engagement, shared values, and open and honest communications. Similarly, I also want to acknowledge our chancellors, presidents, and athletic directors who have been instrumental in getting us to this point. Their leadership is second to none. Our discussions centered on the unprecedented environment within college athletics today and how best we, together, could address the challenges ahead. From the potential significant changes to the NCAA structure and governance, to the impacts of the Alston decision, and the implementation of name, image, and likeness from enacted and potential state and federal legislation to the postseason in college football. There are simply many critical discussions to engage in and decisions to be made in the coming months and years that will shape college athletics for decades. And we believe that together, along with our colleagues across the country, 
we can help play a formative role in both. What became clear from our conversations is that our institutions share values, interests, and a genuine and dedicated commitment to the overall educational missions of our world-class institutions. Collectively, our 41 schools are aligned in our emphasis on educational outcomes and on providing first-class experiences for our students who elect to participate at the highest level of intercollegiate athletics in America. Our everyday commitment to more than 27,000 student athletes within our three conferences will only be enhanced by this new alliance, allowing us to more effectively advocate and work constructively with all other conferences to achieve the best possible balance of education, competition, and commercial activity driven by the best values of higher education. As I'm sure you read in our news, read in our news release, while motivated by our shared interest and common desire to help shape the future of college athletics, we are also driven by the exciting potential of a football and women's and men's basketball scheduling partnership, as well as unique collaborative events for our Olympic sports. We know that in the years ahead, our student athletes, alumni and fans will benefit from thrilling new matchups, which will create new rivalries and excitement within our alliance. The ACC's relationship with the Big Ten and Pac-12 conferences runs deep in our frequent non-conference competition across many sports, as well as through our ACC Big Ten women's and men's basketball challenges, field hockey and softball challenges, as well as our current, current bowl game partnerships. From a longer term perspective, we are bullish on the scheduling alliance as it will elevate the national profile of all of our teams by playing from coast to coast with college fans across the country as the beneficiaries. The combination of national games and having a national impact and influence are key elements of this collaboration and do help create a degree of certainty in an environment that has become increasingly unstable. We recognize that there is still work to be done and decisions to be made regarding future scheduling frameworks. We are grateful to the 11 members of our athletic director subcommittee who will focus on the specific areas of scheduling for consideration. On behalf of the ACC, we are truly honored to be an enthusiastic member of this alliance and look forward to the possibilities that lie ahead. And once again, my sincere appreciation to Commissioners Warren and Klyavkov and our CEOs and ADs for their leadership and support. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips. It's now my pleasure to introduce Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you for your words. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to work uh, with both you and George and to be able to, to discuss issues uh, that are pertinent to college athletics and to feel so strongly now that uh, to have people in this industry, uh, leaders at the ACC and the Pac-12 uh, that uh, we've been able to communicate with uh, to deal with a lot of issues in college athletics. Uh, when the Big Ten had their first meeting at the Palmer House, only a flew, few blocks away from where I sit here today in downtown Chicago, they came together with the vision to really build a conference to be able to provide unique opportunities to their student athletes from an academic standpoint to an athletic standpoint, and to be able to work with George and Jim in this alliance uh, with our respective conferences is really special. And I just want to thank all the media members who over the years who have covered the ACC and the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, the stories that you've told, the hard work, the commitment to excellence that you all have shown, uh, we really do appreciate it. And I also would like to thank all of our chancellors, our presidents, our athletic directors, our faculty athletic representatives, our senior women administrators, our head coaches, our assistant coaches, our student athletes, and also our fans. Today is a special day. I think what it does is signifies that there still is a lot of goodness in college athletics. And this is an opportunity for us to come together 
in a strong alliance to work together, not only with the ACC, the Pac-12, and the Big Ten, but also other conferences in college athletics. But there's turbulence right now in college athletics. There are things that we need to address. We need to have strong leadership. We need to work together. And I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to work with Jim and George and our respective leaders on our campuses and in our conferences to figure a lot of these issues out and also to work with our other conferences around college athletics. But there's a lot of work to be done. This last year has been monumental in college athletics, but also it's provided us with an opportunity to look forward, to come together, and hopefully this alliance will, will really stabilize uh, the different issues that we're facing in college athletics. It'll provide opportunities for our student athletes, again, to not only to get a world-class education at one of our 41 institutions, but also to provide them an opportunity to play just in some epic matchups. And I look forward to working with everyone from a football scheduling alliance, from a women's and men's basketball scheduling alliance, and also in creating ways from an Olympic sports standpoint that we all can work together. But again, I think we have to keep in mind what brought us to this day? What brought us all to college athletics? And that is the student athletes. We need to make sure that we have shared values. We keep academics first. We keep our integrity and honor and collaboration together. And I look forward to not only the coming days, the coming months, but also the coming years. And the impact of us forming this alliance will have on college athletics as we look over the horizon. So again, uh, Jim, George, and all of the people on our various campus campuses, thank you for being leaders. Um, thank you for working together. Thank you for being honest with each other. And we look forward to working together uh, with you, uh, with our bowl partners, with our network partners, to figure out ways that we can make college athletics even more special than it already has been. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to George. And uh, George and Jim, again, I look forward to working with you all on a regular basis. Thank you, Commissioner Warren. And again, it's my uh, privilege to announce uh, Pac-12 Commissioner George Gliavkov. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. I want to start by thanking my fellow commissioners as well from the ACC and Big Ten, Jim and Kevin, along with all of the presidents, chancellors, and athletic directors from each of our three conferences who have come together to make today's alliance announcement possible. More substantive and complex issues have emerged in college sports in the last three months than in any other similar time frame in history. The Alston decision, state and federal legislation, the NCAA's gender equity review report, the future structure of the NCAA, CFP expansion, and of course, conference realignment. The foundation of college sports is in many respects in turmoil. But these matters, while challenging, also present once in a generation opportunities for the leaders in college sports to reevaluate long-standing ways of conducting our business, hit the reset button, and come together to make a positive difference in the future evolution of college sports. Despite the shifting landscape, there are some critical constants among many in college athletics and specifically among every one of the 41 member institutions in our three conferences. These constants include a resolute commitment to our student athlete, a commitment to both academic and athletic excellence, and a commitment to protecting that, that which makes college sports so special for our student athletes, alumni, and fans. The intersection of these constants and the opportunities afforded by all the disruption are the reason we have come together in this alliance. Today is an historic moment, but it is the very beginning of a long journey of collaboration. It is now upon our three conferences to begin the real work that will make a difference and to begin leading the discussion that will bring concrete positive changes, both on the macro critical matters before college sports and with regard to enhancing our inner conference schedules for the benefit of our student athletes, alumni, and fans. I wanna thank my fellow commissioners once again, and Jim, Kevin, and I will be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, gentlemen. We'll now transition to our Q&A portion of today's press conference. Uh, please uh, go ahead and use the raise hand function um, as part of the conference call, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. We're going to start with Dennis Dodd. Dennis, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, guys, for doing this. Um, for all three, I guess, do you support the college football playoff as proposed? Um, and, and why or why not at this point? Thank you, Dennis. Let's go ahead. We'll start this one with Commissioner Phillips, and then we'll go from there. Appreciate the question, Dennis. Um, and I think you know, the last couple of years where we had a group of individuals take a look at a proposed new alternative, um, they did excellent. They did excellent work of providing an analysis and an option for us to consider. And I think as we all got together in Dallas in June, the idea was that we were going to spend the rest of the summer until the third week of September when we reconvened, socializing the playoff. What did we like about it? What, what did we have issues with it? Did it make sense? Too many games. Um, what did it do to the bowl structure and the bowl system itself? And so uh, certainly from an ACC standpoint, we haven't made a, a final decision about uh, where we will fall. Um, we want to take the whole entire period in order to really vet it thoroughly. And like I'm sure has happened with um, the Big Ten and the Pac-12, we've started at the CEO level. We've gone to the ADs, the SWAs, FARs. We've gone to the student athletes, the coaches to collect as many data points as we can in order to give the best assessment and read possible. So that's that's where we find ourselves in the ACC, Dennis. Commissioner Warren. Yes, Dennis, uh, thank you for your question. Thank you for joining and just thank you for your hard work in, in covering um, college football and college athletics. Uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in, uh, in expanding the college football playoff, but also I'm a big believer in being methodical and doing our homework. One of the things that I promised uh, uh, in our last CFP meeting is that we would do our homework. And I've had an opportunity to talk to well over 100 individuals in our Big Ten footprint. I mean, we've talked to all of our football head coaches, our athletic directors, uh, many of our student athletes, our chancellors and presidents, and, and we'll be talking to our faculty athletic representatives and our SWAs and uh, just gathering feedback. And so I think we need to be very methodical as we make decisions because this will impact uh, our student athletes. And so we need to think through, you know, the length of the season, uh, health and wellness issues, not only physical, but also mental, uh, primarily the academics. How does this impact final exams? Um, you know, we're in the Midwest, we're in cold weather climates. We need to make sure our stadiums are winterized. Uh, how does this impact our network partners? All of these different issues need to be reviewed, analyzed, and assimilated. We're still working on that now. I'm looking forward to our meeting in September. Uh, but again, uh, the committee uh, led by Greg Sankey and, and Craig Thompson and, and Jack Swarbrick and, and Bob Bosley did an incredible job. They spent hours upon hours of looking at these different issues. So we're still unpacking this information, but I do think uh, whenever a decision is made, we need to make sure that we have an inclusive voice. We need to make sure we keep our student athletes at the center of all of our decisions, do the right thing by them. And I'm confident and not only in Jim and George, but also all of our other brethren around college athletics and, and um, that we'll make the right decision and do the right thing at the right time. And it's uh, I appreciate the leadership of, of Bill Hancock and his staff with the CFP. They've done an outstanding job. So these uh, the future will be interesting as we work through uh, what is the right thing to do for our student athletes and for the game of college football? I'll just briefly add that uh, the Pac-12 is 100% in favor of expansion of the college football playoffs, um, that there are issues at the margins, although I'll repeat what Kevin and Jim said, which is the work that was done by the committee to come up with the 12-team playoff is exemplary. There's a lot of really, really good stuff in there, but we're going through a process, as, as both of my colleagues mentioned, and for me, that means condensing my visits to every single school so that they're terminated by September 28th. So I can get face-to-face -face feedback from every one of our universities 
I was in Boulder, Colorado yesterday. I'm in Eastern Washington today. And uh, we're, we're all doing this work so that by September 28th, we have very good feedback to provide back to the broader committee. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Pat Forty. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, uh, for whoever uh, can answer this. Uh, there are obviously some, some big ideas here, but there's not much in the way of a timeline. Uh, I understand that that could be a bit of a moving target, but can the, the, the word I've seen is whenever it's practical. When do we, Can we at least give some rough ideas what is practical in terms of scheduling uh, in uh, football games, basketball games, women's basketball games? Commissioner Warren, can we start with you for this one, please? Sure, Pat. Uh, uh, good to uh, hear your voice. Yeah, and one of the things we have to keep in mind is that we already have uh, some existing relationships between the ACC and the Pac-12 and the, the Big Ten. I mean, starting with basketball, uh, we have an, an ACC Big Ten challenge. Uh, with the Pac-12, we have a volleyball uh, relationship that we've been able to build with them. And then from a football standpoint, you think about September 11th this year, we have Oregon who will be playing at Ohio State and Washington who will be playing at Michigan. I believe between 2022 and 2035, there are already 68 games that are on uh, the schedule from a football standpoint. And um, and that's not including even Notre Dame in that number. I think if you include Notre Dame, it's 103 games. So a lot of existing games are already on the schedule. What this allows us to do is to focus on um, the existing games that we have. Uh, how do we couch those? How do we build storylines around those? How do we expand those schedules? Pat, I think one thing to keep in mind is that we've promised each other is that we're not going to interfere with any existing contracts that exist. So this is not about getting out of contracts and blowing anything up. This is about honoring those existing contracts, but also building relationships uh, between these uh, three uh, like-minded conferences as we look forward from a scheduling standpoint, not only in football, but in women's and men's basketball and also in Olympic sports and to see if there's opportunity uh, to build early season, mid season uh, tournaments or, or, or unique um, games that will come together. So as I think Jim has said in his comments and George said it, you know, we're really at the beginning stages of this, but the beautiful thing about this, we have some of the brightest minds in all of college athletics um, in our athletic departments, with our athletic directors, and also our leaders on campus. So to be able to get in the room now over these next couple of weeks and months and start rolling up our sleeves and going to work to figure out how this uh, will come together is exciting. I mean, we know the, the elements are there. We have the willingness to work together. We will work together. And I think you'll see some really exciting opportunities for our football basketball, both men and women in our Olympic sports student athletes as we start unpacking uh, the scheduling component of this. Commissioner Kliavkov, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add. Kevin and I are 100% aligned on this, as I know Jim is as well. Okay. okay. We will take our next question from Dan Wolken. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm curious what kind of document has been signed or will be signed to formalize this alliance, uh, how will it be legally enforceable? And will it include any language that prevents one league in this alliance from poaching members of another league? We'll go ahead and start with Commissioner Kliabkoff for this. There, there's no signed contract. There's an agreement among three gentlemen, and there is a commitment from 41 presidents and chancellors and 41 athletic directors to do what we say we're going to do. If there's any um, lack of specificity in the press release, it's because we want to make sure we could deliver 100% of what we promised. So we're aligned in how we want to approach this, but there's no contract. There's no signed document, and there doesn't need to be. Commissioner Phillips or Commissioner Warren, either of you want to react? I think George said it well. Yeah. Great. We will transition to our next question, which will be Lane Higgins. Lane? 
Hey there. This one is primarily for George, but anyone can chime in. Um, obviously, one of the biggest pieces of college sports we've seen is this um, push for maximizing revenue from TV. And obviously, having these big non-conference marquee games is big, but also getting into different time zones is important. Um, could you speak to you know how this impacted the thought process and the decision making in you know forming this alliance and how much that um, you know is increasingly important now that the SEC is adding two members that are, you know, large eyeball getters in college sports. There may be residual benefits from this alliance related to increased revenue opportunities, but that wasn't the focus of why we did the alliance. We did the alliance to protect the collegiate model, to work together on these important issues, and to create unique new opportunities for our next generation of student athletes and our fans and alumni who want to see these great games that we'll be able to create. So we weren't focused on revenue when we were creating the alliance. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Kirk Bowles. Yes, to, to any of the three gentlemen, uh, I'm curious uh, if y'all fear for the survival of the Big 12 uh, once the expansion goes through, and is that bad for the future of college football and athletics? We'll go ahead and, uh, Commissioner Warren, do you want to start this one? Thank sure. you. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, quite naturally, you know, uh, speaking for us in the Big Ten, and and um, and I'm sure George and Jim feel this way. I have the utmost respect uh, for Bob Bosley, the commissioner of the Big 12. Uh, he's been a great leader uh, in the Big 10 at Iowa and in the Pac-12 at, at Stanford and also uh, with the Big 12. So I'm confident that under Bob's leadership that uh, he will do what's best for his conference. And again, you know, a lot of these, uh, these issues that we've been dealing with are, are issues that have, have been uh, – uh, on the table here for really weeks and 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 not months, and so a lot of this stuff is fresh and new. But I'm sure Bob will will uh, will figure things out and will do what is right uh, for the Big 12. There are a lot of fine uh, institutions in the Big 12, not only from an academic standpoint, but from an athletic standpoint. And so I think as as you know situations like today, by announcing this, as we said, and I feel very strongly about. Hopefully, this will bring some much needed stability in college athletics. And I also think what it will do is now it will allow people to understand where everyone else stands uh, because some of the events over the last couple months uh, have, have kind of shaken the foundation of, of the beliefs of college athletics. And so hopefully this will allow uh, other conferences um, to be able to kind of work through their various issues and, and figure out what's best for them in the future. But again, Bob has only had an incredible a successful history, and I'm confident that he'll figure out uh, what to do uh, with with his leaders in the Big 12 and, and on behalf of his student athletes. Let, let me jump in as well. I think Kevin said it well. Um, let me put it directly. We want and need the Big 12 to do well. Mm -hmm. The Big 12 matters in college athletics. The Big 12 matters in Power 5 athletics and our FBS group. And so I, I can just tell you that we'll be watching what occurs here. And obviously this transition isn't supposed to be taking place for another four years, but this group in particular will be very interested to see what happens and to do everything that we can to try to make sure that again, college athletics looks similar to what it is today about the numbers of opportunities, the commitment to one another, the support of one another um, during really difficult moments, which we're faced with right now. Thank you. We will take our next question from David Teal. This is for all three, given your intent not to blow up any current scheduling contracts, but add more games among your three conferences. Is college football moving to a regular season where the Power Five, Autonomy Five, play only one another? Uh, I, I can start by saying there's no intention as part of the alliance about increasing the number of games uh, that 
the football teams play during a regular season. And there is no intention to stop our teams from being able to, within the alliance, also schedule games against any other conference um, that they want to schedule games against. They'll have flexibility in games that they'll be able to schedule. And it's our hope that they continue to schedule games against other Power Five conferences and uh, other conferences in Division One as well. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Andrea Adelson. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, doing this. Uh, for all three, if, if I could, if the finances weren't really the sole focus and there has been a lot of discussion about uh, the SEC pulling further ahead financially, um, what is this alliance specifically going to do to, to help that if the finances aren't something that you guys are focused on? Well, I'm happy to uh, jump in. I, I, I would say... Uh, I don't think anyone said we aren't focused on finances. I would, what I said was that that's not the driving issue that caused us to form the alliance. Uh, obviously, everyone's focused on finances and focused on doing what's best for all of their schools and will continue to do that. I think the creation of these interconference games across all time zones with interesting new matchups uh, provides all of us the opportunity to think about how that benefits our schools long term. Commissioner Warren or Commissioner Phillips? Yeah, I think, I think George, I mean, said it well. So I think the biggest thing is for us to start uh, as far as what's the right thing to do. And I think what this does is it allows us to lean into certain uh, academic issues, uh, mental health and physical wellness issues, health and safety of our student athletes, gender equity issues, social justice um, it allows us to take a look at, you know, all of those things that we're facing now on a daily basis that impact our student athletes. And quite naturally, it allows us to create compelling matchups. And like I said, not only in football, but in men's and women's basketball and other Olympic sports and, and, and do things from a preseason standpoint and midseason. Uh, we just will work through a lot of different ideas. And one of the things we're fortunate to all have great uh, media partners. Um, and just with the changing climate and in, in the media landscape on just linear television and and from an, an OTT standpoint, there will probably be some unique opportunities. But one of the things that we've promised ourselves is do the right thing for the right reasons for the right people. And that is for our student athletes. And in doing so, I think it'll be very clear that that other unique uh, opportunities, not only from a media, but from a business standpoint, will be uh, created uh, but for for the for the right reasons at the right time. But but today is really, you know, is a signal that uh, three strong conferences uh, have an opportunity who have shared values and and uh, and to be able to work together and who want to prioritize the things that we feel that are important in college athletics at this point in time. I, I would just add one other element, because I think both George and Kevin uh, answered your question well, Andrea. But at times we, we understand the, the financial piece and it, and it usually is the driver of a lot of decisions. And I can speak to you directly in the sense that this was a time that we felt we had a responsibility to stabilize a volatile environment, to focus in on the things structurally that we have to do if we want to see college athletics not only survive, but ex excel and that is new government instruction, Alston, what we're faced with with the transfer portal, et cetera. And so sometimes it can't be driven by money. Sometimes it has to be the fundamental components of the enterprise that you fight for, that you have a responsibility for, and that ultimately you're committed to making sure that it lasts for the next generation of student athletes. And this is too important to too many student athletes across the country, 500,000 or so. The collegiate model, though imperfect, mm -hmm. is a place that allows access and affordability to a group of young people that may have never accessed higher education or ever have had a chance to pay to go to college. Thank you. We will take our next question from Bruce Feldman. 
Thanks, Amy. A uh, question for you guys just from earlier about there being no signed document. I mean, Jim, you just talked about stabilizing a volatile environment. I mean, what do you say to people who listen to that and think, you know, I, I mean, I've talked to some big 12 ADs who felt like the big 12 was a stable it had been for the last decade to have no signed document. You have 41 different schools. Obviously there are some that are going to have seem to have more leverage than others who would, you know, to think that there is no signed document, that this Alliance isn't very binding at all. Um, how do you, I guess, how do you ensure people feel like this is actually has some strength where you don't think somebody's going to pull an end run or do something outside the alliance to better their own specific situation. I'd say this, Bruce, it's about trust. It's about we've looked each other in the eye. We've made an agreement. We have great confidence and faith. Our board chairs have looked each other in the eye and have committed to the same level of support and connection to one another. Our athletics directors have done that. And so if that's what it takes to get something considerable done, then, you know, we've, we've lost our way. Of course, binding contracts uh, serve a purpose. But at this juncture, that to us wasn't a critical element of it. And um, we'll certainly see where all this goes. But, but I know what we discussed. We all know what was the, we discussed. And we're very confident about executing on all that's been described today. Bruce, good to hear your voice. And again, I think it's a great question. And, and even though I'm a lawyer, I mean, but uh, one of the things that one of my uh, most favorite law professors at uh, Notre Dame would say that uh, uh, if you have to go back and look at a contract that you signed, you probably entered a deal with the wrong parties. And then I think what that says is our contracts important? Absolutely. They're critically important. But where we are in college athletics right now, uh, what we really need is, is things to be stable. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. I mean, you look at the NCAA going through the Constitutional Convention review. I mean, we have NIL. We have Austin. We have CFP expansion. We have the gender equity you know, issues. I mean, we have many, many issues that we have to deal with, and especially conference realignment. And so we just felt that we could look each other in the eyes shake each other's hand to say that we have a fiduciary responsibility to the past student athletes, our current student athletes and the future student athletes uh, to be able to do something that is right, you know, for once uh, and to really work together. And I can speak from experience. My father was a student athlete in the forties uh, at Arizona state university when fought in the war war came back and finished his, his degree uh, my brother was a student athlete in the 60s at Stanford. I was a student athlete in the 80s, and my son is a student athlete right now at Michigan State. So just speaking from experience, the, that whole essence of college athletics has run through my family all the way since the 1940s. And it gave people who look like me an opportunity to go to college, uh, to be able to compete athletically, to get multiple degrees. Uh, to be able to learn about teamwork and honor and, and faith and camaraderie and integrity. And so I'm a big believer that there are some times in life that you need to be able to work together and do what's right for the right reasons. And I think what this shows today, even to our current student athletes, that adults uh, can come together, can work together, can keep their word and do what's right uh, for the younger people who are looking up to us. So it's been a proud moment to be able to work with Jim, to be able to work with George, to be able to work with all of our campus constituents to come together and let's say, let's do something that's well needed at this point in time. Show some leadership. All of the other accoutrements will, will come at the appropriate time. But I think today and the next couple of months will really be about making sure that we're organized, that we create some stability and in this enterprise of college athletics that has been good to so many people, many of you who are uh, who are in the media, you were blessed to be college athletics, uh, but participate in college athletics. But I know speaking from from where I sit and, and the impact of being a student athlete has had on my family and uh, still has on my family to this day, I will forever be grateful uh, to this environment of college athletics and will do everything that I possibly can with these two men and other conferences 
for us to be able to work together as we look forward and leave a lasting legacy that we owe. We have a responsibility to our future generations to do what's right at the right time for the right reasons. You know, today, today is a press release, but it's also a commitment and it's a commitment among 41 institutions. And I would say what my parents taught me, which is um, don't measure me by what we say, measure us by what we do over the coming uh, months and years and decades. And uh, I couldn't be happier about the Alliance and um, I'm okay with there not being a signed contract. We didn't even focus on that, didn't even talk about that. We'll take our next question from Adam Rittenberg. Yeah, hi guys, just thanks for taking the time. I'm just curious of all the factors that may have motivated this discussion and the ultimate alliance. How much was the SEC's uh, expansion with Texas and Oklahoma in that process? How much did that factor in, whether it didn't at all or, or, or did at some point when you guys were putting this together? I'll answer that to start, Adam. Good to hear your voice. Uh, I have great respect for the SEC. I have great respect for Greg Sankey and his leadership. Um, I would say one of the most powerful mentors in my life was Mike Slive, uh, who was the SEC commissioner uh, before Greg, who, who helped train Greg. Um, you know, Mike had an Im important just role in, in my life. My son is an SEC graduate. Uh, he received an undergraduate degree from Mississippi uh, State University before he became a grad transfer to Michigan State University. And so um, even as late as yesterday, you know, we have weekly calls with our A5 commissioners and Bob and Greg and George, Jim and myself were on the phone call. Um, so we communicate regularly um, and quite naturally, I, I, I think what the SEC um, had an opportunity in, 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 in accepting Texas and Oklahoma to their conference um, I think what that did is that that allowed all of us in college athletics to to make you maybe take a step back and take a step forward to really start evaluating what will the next one, three, five, seven, 10, 15 years look like in college athletics. I mean, quite naturally, because we're in this business, we're always aware of conference realignment. I mean, the Big Ten has grown over the last couple of years uh, by having individuals from other conferences join. So that's always there. Uh, but I just think... Um, uh, you know, from 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 where we sit, we have to be aware as far as what's going on. I mean, even one of the things that we learned from COVID last year is that we live in uncertain times. So I wouldn't say this is a reaction to Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC, but I think uh, uh, to 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 be totally candid is that you have to evaluate, you know, what's going on in the landscape of college athletics. And, and, uh, but with all the things that we, we are facing, which we've talked about on numerous occasions and, and where we really are, uh, this is a year for seismic shifts. And I think it's really important to make sure that you are, are aware of all these different things going on and make sure that from our individual conferences that we do all we can to make sure we protect our conferences and, and, uh, and build strong, you know, relationships to make sure that we protect our, our student athletes. I would also just add, Adam, appreciate the call. In the history of college athletics, one expansion of a conference has usually led to another, to another, and to another. And to the three of us, we felt the stabilization of the current environment across Division I and FBS and, and Power Five in particular. This was its chance for a new direction, a new initiative that I don't think has ever been done before and felt that that was the most appropriate step at this current time. And we're proud of it. We really are. And, um, and I think we all believe this is the right step in order for all of us to move forward at a critical juncture. Again, when you talk about a new governing structure, the 21st model of the NCAA, Alston, we're all dealing with that. So we're better together than we are separate. But I think you have to have a group that, that really understands that expansion doesn't mean you, you end up changing membership across multiple conferences in a significant shortened period of time. Thank you. 
We're going to take two more questions. The first one here is from Nicole Auerbach. Yeah, this uh, just a quick question about that football scheduling piece that is to come uh, for George and Kevin. To make this work, would you need to go down to eight conference games? Nicole, good to hear your voice. And you always ask uh, those uh, pointed questions. I mean, that's one of the things that we, we uh, will have to address at the appropriate time. Because as we said, one, uh, we promise that we're going to keep all of our existing um, contracts and games are in order. Um, as you are aware, some conferences have eight games. Um, we're a conference that has nine conference games. So all of those different issues, you know, which, which we knew were on the horizon over these last couple of years, uh, now with the scheduling, scheduling allowance, um, they, they're put on the table now that we'll have to address those to, to make sure that uh, we're able to expand the relationship with the ACC uh, and the Pac-12. So that's one of the, the items that we definitely will be working with through uh, our, uh, our leaders in our conference. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about having uh, former coach and athletic director Barry Alvarez from Wisconsin join our conference office because he now will be an asset to all of us here to be able to work through from a coach and administrator and leader standpoint. But those are the kind of issues that we'll be dealing with over the next you know weeks, months to years as we look forward to, to building the scheduling alliance together. We have a contractual commitment through the end of our media rights term to play nine conference games. Um, so to move to fewer games sooner than three years, we'd need to have a partnership with ESPN and Fox to do that. Although I think there's a compelling argument that the games that we could replace those with if they were in the alliance uh, would be very compelling and, and, and worth making that move sooner. But we'll work through that with our media partners and with our alliance partners. Thank you. We'll take our final question from Ralph Russo. Thanks, Amy, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I'm interested in something of a timeline of this, and I guess I would ask who who brought this up first. You know, like whose idea was this initially to get the ball rolling? I'll jump in there. Uh, it was, I think, three motivated commissioners that felt that this was the time for us to come together and do something that we felt collectively was the right thing at the right time. The, the timeline per se, um, it's been over the last month or so that we've um, literally been married to one another and, and connected more maybe than we have been to our spouses with the time and effort and, and commitment we've had to being together, uh, both in face as, as well as you know, through normal means of communication. And as far as the execution of it moving forward, it begins now. It begins today. We have a, a wonderful group of 11 athletic directors that represent the three conferences that have had a chance to meet several times already and, um, and push this thing ahead. And I think the one thing we all appreciate and understand is the practitioners, the directors of athletics, the, the, they're going to have to execute this and it's going to have to work and we have 41 unique schools. And so it may work sooner for some schools and some leagues before it does for all. But again, I think we're all bullish about being able to really execute on what we've described today. Well said. <laughs> Thank you all, gentlemen. We appreciate your time today and your leadership on this alliance. We appreciate all of our participants for joining us and the attendees as well. We hope you have a great afternoon and thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. God bless you. All right. Thanks, George and Jim. So there you have it. The three commissioners of the Big Ten, the ACC, and the Pac-12 addressing the media on this alliance and got a little bit of an insight into what it is. And again, some of the things that we discussed before we heard from the commissioner, certainly a governance component to it. Much of the focus, though, around scheduling, what it would take for these teams to play one another on a regular basis in football, pointed out the fact that there are already many games on the schedule. But again, a sense that at some point here in the future, there is going to be a movement toward playing one another more frequently. What that might mean more broadly in terms of the number of conference games in each league, still very much up in the air. And then just a general sense 
from this group that they were trying to, and I'll, I'll quote Jim Phillips here, protect the collegiate model. And again, a, a sense that things are evolving dramatically here, that we're at a time of great change in college athletics, and that they wanted to take a step back, work with groups that were like-minded to them, and continue along the path in some ways of where college athletics has been historically with an eye on the fact that we are in a time of dramatic change. So again, that's the big picture of what we heard. We're going to dive into it quite a bit more here on the Big Ten Network. Take a quick break before we do that, but keep it here. We will continue to talk about the Alliance, the Big Ten, the Pac-12, the ACC, joining hands moving forward in college sports. Continuing to dive into the alliance between the Big Ten, the ACC, and the Pac-12. Very pleased to be joined now by Nicole Auerbach, of course, of The Athletic, but also a frequent contributor here on the Big Ten Network. Nicole, we listened to all three of the conference commissioners interested in your biggest takeaway in terms of what you believe today was about. Well, it, it was pretty vague, uh, which is actually the way that a lot of people have been describing this to me over the last week or so, you know, that this is about having a voting block on issues like college football playoff expansion and help determining what the future of the collegiate model looks like. But that's a very vague premise. And so I think, you know, there were multiple pointed questions about not signing any contracts, not having any um, financial relationships or, or penalties tied to this, or even kind of, you know, just looking each other in the eye and saying, you know, this is a gentleman's agreement. So I think there's going to be some skeptics about just wondering how much this actually ties these leagues together. But that's how it's been described as, as again, an alliance. It's alignment on issues, voting together in the future, helping to shape things moving forward. So to me, I was expecting something fairly vague, but I, I think for people who are wondering, you know, what tangible but what will this mean for college sports, or is this just a response to what the SEC did? I think there's probably still asking those questions. What portion of the collegiate model do you believe they are most looking to protect, or do they most feel is in jeopardy? 
Well, the, the first thing that, you know, anyone you talk to in these leagues talks about is, is the broad based sports offerings. It's about how many different sports, big 10 schools and ACC and Pac-12 schools offer Olympic sports, the pipelines to the Olympics, all of those are things are very important to the identities of these conferences and providing those opportunities. They're also going to talk when they say like-minded, they mean about academic standings. You know, we've heard the phrase AAU universities. That's really important to the big 10. So those are things that tie them together. They don't want to see this go down a path in five years where, you know, the only sports that people are playing anymore are the sports that bring in the most money and that those athletes are getting paid salaries and it's just a minor league system. Like they want to preserve the, basically the purity of the college model. And that's what you hear, especially as we head into this phase where the NCAA is calling a constitution convention and they're trying to figure out what this model looks like. That's where these three leagues, I think, are aligned in wanting to preserve opportunities for a lot of different athletes, female athletes, Title IX compliance, Olympic sports, all of those pieces of the puzzle, and not just get to a point where this is only about the sports that bring in money. There is such a focus, though, on those sports that bring in money in the college football playoff and college football playoff expansion has been a huge talk of, topic of conversation in this offseason. Where do you believe these three leagues stand on that? We heard varying. Certainly, George Klyovkov made it very clear the Pac-12 was in favor of expansion. Kevin Warren said the same about the Big Ten. What, what, what do you think, though, the right number is for this group? Well, it, it could end up being 12. I think that there's there's two factors that are coming to play about playoff expansion. I think these three commissioners in these three leagues are would be wise to delay the implementation, to let this go to 2026 when the contract's up with ESPN and get other broadcast partners involved. There's more games, more rounds, more money at stake to take this to the open market. But I also think you have three commissioners and three conferences that weren't part of the the process that developed the 12 team model. So I think even if they like parts of it and George Klyovkov said the issues he has are at the margins. Um, I, I think it's, it's about being in the room that shapes a decision like that. And then that model being placed on the table in front of the rest of the commissioners. And, and we've heard, you know, from varying degrees and people in all these three leagues that it's weird to have, you know, the future a postseason marquee event shaped without those three leagues having input and, and not hashing it out and kind of doing it after the fact. So that's a separate issue. I don't know if that ultimately leads to a different size, a different format, but it could, you know, impact where games are played and some of the details of the proposal itself. But I think that's different than trying to delay the implementation of an expanded playoff, no matter what size that is. Fascinating stuff. A significant day for sure in the history of college athletics and certainly in the Big Ten, Nicole Auerbach of The Athletic. Really pleased you could lend your insights. Great work on this story as always. Thanks for having me. That'll be it for us here on the Big Ten Network, but plenty more coverage on this story throughout the day, including on the big show coming up later today here on the Big Ten Network. Again, the Big Ten entering into an alliance with the ACC and the Pac-12 as they look to shape the future of college athletics.